Hello, Philip here. I was invited to DevFest for Ukraine to give a talk about game development for app developers. And of course I said yes, but I couldn't attend live because I'm taking care of the kid at the time. So I said, I'll create a video. And they said, yes, we need a video of about 20 minutes. And I um, started recording and realized I have 50 minutes or maybe even more than that. And so, of course, I gave them an edited down shortened version of the talk. Uh, but I thought, OK, maybe I'll make a version that's the extended cut and which is exactly what this is. So um, if you want to watch the talk in its extended version, here you go. Have fun. Hello, my name is Philip. Some of you may remember me from the olden days when I was uh, at Google in the Flutter team as a developer advocate. But now since September, I'm at large. <laughs> I'm, uh, I have my own company, which is just me, and I am building games. And so this talk will be about games. I published a game last year and it, uh, it's called Knights of San Francisco. It is a little different than what you might expect from games. And I thought, hey, a lot of people are kind of like me, especially people who come to these dev fests. Um, there are app developers, be it they do, you know, Android SDK development, Flutter development, web development. Um, they do apps and um, maybe they don't know that they could use basically 90% of what they already know to, uh, instead of building apps, build games. But before I jump into that, I want to say that I'm really uh, honored and proud to be able to be part of this event, DevFest for Ukraine. And uh, it's because I think Ukraine really needs our help against this invasion. And here in the Czech Republic, I think we understand this. We've had, albeit 50 years ago, we've had an invasion that um, is eerily similar to, in some respects, uh, to, to the, the one that Ukraine is suffering right now. I thought you might like this. These are Czech fans on a hockey championship and they were disallowed from showing a Ukrainian flag. So instead they showed this. <laughs> um, it's uh, imagination. As I always say, um, your imagination is the best graphics card. Um, anyway, so that that's really important for me, but let's get into the actual topic of, of this talk. So again, I want to talk about games. If you are already a front-end or web or um, app developer of any kind, I uh, some people have me associated with Flutter very strongly for good reason. I've been in the Flutter team for five years. I um, am still using Flutter, my game is in Flutter, but this is not about Flutter game development specifically. This is about understanding that some games are pretty good fit for you if you are, if you are already an app developer. App development turns out to be pretty close to some game development, and that this is what, what I'm going to cover today. So if you're doing app development with the web, React, Angular, whatever is the cool new thing, if you're doing development in Swift UI, if you're doing development in Android SDK, uh, if you're using Flutter as myself, all of these are really good frameworks and technologies for you to, to, build, um, to build your own game studio, basically. I like to say that games are basically in two categories, um, video games, the more traditional video games, and app-like games. And that is not something that a gamer will know, like no gamer will say, hey, I'm going to play a, a app-like game today or something like this, or I want to buy an app-like game. But from the perspective of us, the developers, this makes a lot of sense to, to think about it that way, right? So video games are games, are the, the more traditional ones where you have a joystick or a mouse and a keyboard or a controller and you continually apply some kind of input and, uh, and then the game itself will redraw 
every frame, 60 times per second, 120 times per second, what have you, um, and it will change basically all the pixels every frame, right? So these are the video games. It's, they, they, I call them video games because they're video. <laughs> like like every every frame is different, right? And um, and also a big deal is we we take the input 60 frames per second and 60 times per second or something like that. And, and then uh, we change the parameters of the simulation, we apply it to the world by tiny bits, right? So these are video games. And then we have these app-like games. Since the beginning of games, we have had these games where instead of continually applying some input, uh, you are basically using it as an app, but the, the app is there for uh, for entertainment, for fun, it doesn't. Uh, sometimes for learning, but it it doesn't um, uh, let you. I don't know. Add to do items, anything to, to anything, but it simulates something cool, right? And we'll get back to that. But but app like games are um, are a thing. Uh, I, I think the very first computer game that ever existed was actually an app like game. It was for some generals or someone uh, for them to be able to simulate uh, basically a war game between themselves, right? So, so um, this came before Space War even, or Pong, or um, Pac-Man, right? Um, and of course it's still around. Uh, I like to give the example of a very successful indie game called Slay the Spire, uh, which is, in the end, it's, it doesn't look like an app, but it, you use it as an app. You have little things that you can click on, uh, maybe you can drag and drop a little bit, uh, you have, um, you see numbers, things, things change on the screen, but it's, it, you can look at it as a game, right? A, a very fancy game with music and with weird lore, but an app nevertheless. So we have video games and apply games. There you have it. Two categories, very useful for you as a game developer or budding game developer to think about, right? If you're thinking about game development, I'm pretty sure you're probably leaning towards the video games, because again, they are more traditional, they are often more cool and dynamic and stuff like this, right? But let me be blunt, you won't make the next Skyrim or Minecraft or Destiny or something like that. I'm sorry, but unless you have like 200 million dollars in your pocket, uh, that's not gonna happen. That ship has sailed. Uh, of course, there's always exceptions and there's always a chance, okay, but it's like that shouldn't be your strategy. Your strategy shouldn't be basically winning a lottery, right? So uh, video games, still possible to do it if you want to go alone, but hard mode, okay? Very hard mode game development uh, to try and, and, and do something as a video game these days. And there are many reasons for that. Um, basically, everyone is, is doing it, first. Second, um, it is a very special, to, to build a video game is a very specialized set of skills. Uh, you probably need to go with something like Unity or Goda or something like that. Uh, if, you're, if you're a profile that I described in the beginning of this talk, um, you probably don't know that much about C Sharp and, and Unity and, um, you know, all, all that stuff, ECS. Um, so, you know, play to your strength and that means probably don't choose video games as your, as your um, opportunity. On the other hand, apply games, hmm, you already know how to build apps, uh, you, you can use the technology that you all already know for this, right? Uh, if you fail, you still have learned a lot 
of lessons that you can then apply to app development and um, you are not competing in app-like development, you're not competing against AAA titles of studios that are like literally, it's like competing against Hollywood, uh, but you're competing against other people like you often, uh, that, uh, or like very small studios that, that do these kinds of games. And lastly, if you look at um, like Steam and other places where you can bu buy games, and if you look at the analytics, you'll see that actually apply games make money. Uh, they, they, they are often very successful as in, in terms of like making money. And that's because um, a lot of people will just go and be like, oh, what can I do? I'll do a platformer. And then they'll do a platformer. And so you have this like a huge amount of platformers that nobody can ever play uh, all, all of them. And um, it's not really something that a lot of people uh, who have money want to play anyway, right? But if you build one of those app-like games, you'll see that your audience is widening and your competition is narrowing, which is always a good thing. <laughs> uh, so uh, app-like games really are even, it's not just easy mode as in like, it's easy to build. Um, it might not be easier to build, but it's easier to get out there and and get some people to actually play your game, if not even pay for the game. Wow. So, all right, let's say you are sold and you are like, okay, how do I try this? Like, okay, I'm a, an app dev developer. I uh, maybe want to build something I haven't thought maybe about like doing an app-like game, but I'm interested in building some game uh, in general. Where do I start? So I say, first understand that all games are simulations. It'll, you should probably, in my opinion, start with thinking about simulations and what you wanna simulate. All games are simulations. Super Mario? A simulation. It is a simulation. It seems weird. It's uh, obviously a simulation of something very, very not realistic. Uh, but it is a simulation. It has physics in it. It has um, AI or agents that do something. Uh, it has rules and that there's a running simulation there that you can interact with, interact with and play. So is Pac-Man. So is Pong. But so is also obviously all the other, other games that are out there. So your job is to come up with something to simulate that is interesting. And I say specifically interesting because that word encompasses a few things and in it. It, it. Something that's interesting probably isn't boring, right? Uh, so yes, you could simulate an accounting job uh, but unless something very cool is happening in that encountering job, it's not probably interesting enough to make a game out of it, right? Um, but it also uh, encompasses some kind of fun, uh, but also something new, like so something that people want to experience, uh, but maybe haven't even thought about doing it, right? Um, there are some really cool uh, games that simulate some really cool stuff out there. We can start with things like, oh, I want to be a pirate. I can, can we simulate how it is to be a pirate? You, you know, Sid Meier's Pirates uh, and a bunch of other things, uh, other games are about simulating that, right? Uh, but there's also, um, in my view, more interesting, maybe a little less fun simulations. Or games uh, one of them is change where you are uh, literally you you become in this game a homeless person and you need to and this is a simulation of a, of a life of, of a homeless person and then so, so to you it might be um, a eye-opening to to understand what what their situation is day by day and uh, you know, all the things that you haven't thought about, you now need to not only understand, but also deal with. Uh, so, so I'm not saying 
Uh, to me, games are not just about like, hey, let's just, you know, spend some time, kill, kill uh, a few hours by doing something cool. Uh, but they can be also about giving people some experience that they wouldn't have before, making them smarter, basically. So think about what you know or what you have interest in that could be simulated and that could be simulated with interest. And there are probably, you should probably write it down and, and make many, many different examples and, and choices before you really set on, on one, right? But um, go through that exercise and, and see what could be simulated uh, that, that might be fun for you. Now, the next question after you know what you want to simulate is, can you simulate it as an app-like game? Um, this could be hard, right? Because the, the mind immediately jumps to, I want uh, I, to, to video games. Um, let's simulate pirates. So you just, you just have, or make it, maybe you drive a boat, like a pirate, pirate boat, pirate ship, uh, through the waves, and then you shoot cannons. That's a video game, uh, at, at least right now in my mind, right? But you have to give some thought into, okay, can I make this into uh, an app-like game experience instead? And it turns out in many cases, yes, you can. And it's actually sometimes more interesting to do it this way and uh, you will get more people to, to want to play your game. For example, let's say you're really into football. Um, I mean soccer, but it's probably the same even if we're, we would be talking about American football. Anyway, you're into football. Uh, the easiest thing to, uh, to think about if you're trying to build a football game is a video game where you have a joystick and you're a controller and then uh, you play football in real time, right? Um, but that's one way of making football into a, a computer game. But another one is to have something like Football Manager, where you're like, okay, I have, I'm a manager of a football team, I buy um, footballers or people who play football, football players, and I, uh, I can, you know, uh, uh, change tactics and uh, do all that stuff, right? One of my favorite games from when I was a little kid was uh, called Footballer of the Year, uh, which was basically, it was uh, on a lower level, you were a football player, uh, but you didn't just run around the, the you know, playing field, uh, instead, you were, it was basically like you, you were given cards, which were like, oh, there's, you have a chance to, to play a goal and you could, um, if I remember correctly, it was something like that. Uh, it was an app-like game, basically, with little mini games sprinkled in, into it, but most of the thing was, was just an app-like game and it was really fascinating to me and I played it way more than the traditional football games because it was just like I was able the, the simulation was more interesting to me because it was like going from um, a, some kid that can play football into some kid on um, you know in a championship or world championship player and uh, getting better along the way and, and so on and so forth so even then, and even in something like football, you can have an app-like game. So it's not, hopefully at this point, it's not very hard to imagine in other fields that all of these could be uh, made into an app-like game and not just a video game. So now you have an idea and you have a technology. Again, you can, be, if you're an Android SDK developer, just use Android SDK to build your app-like game because that's what you're doing anyway. Don't try to like overanalyze it. Just just do what you already know and um, it'll work out, right? Um, there's this almost a cliche of 
people who come into game development and they start by uh, building an engine basically they 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 overanalyze everything and um, instead of building a game they they just um, go into the details and technicalities and they kind of enjoy it there and it's this is something that also happened to me by the way it happens to everyone I think um, it's for us software engineers it's a kind of a safe space to be working on interesting little problems and sometimes interesting large problems that are deeply technical right um, to me building an engine is long term more fun than building a game on an existing engine um, because with an engine i don't actually need to like the, the, it, that's a very um, limited but interesting problem with a, but with a game you first have to learn an engine or something and, and then second you have to do all these other things that uh, we engineers sometimes are not that good at um, you know like a game design and test testing with other people and showing other people our stuff and product basically decisions and stuff like this and this can be scary so i think unconsciously we are kind of like ah you know what i'll i'll rewrite it with i'm um, i'll use a different game engine or i'll i'll do this or that and i'll make this more performant instead of actually releasing a game so don't fall into that trap start building with what you already know the good news is that at this level game development is really fun um, you are still basically simulating some something, right? So, so even if you're doing an app, um, you're probably working with objects such as account, and uh, then the account will, you know, go uh, will have be signed in or not signed in, and and then a to do item will appear and uh, it will be attached to something. Blah blah blah. Uh, inherently this is less satisfying and fun to work with than what you will be doing in game development where instead of account signed in to do item you have things like oh i have a city and the city has population and it is attached to a road network and uh, that population is maybe going up or down uh, you know and there's a ruler and here's a little little warplanes <laughs> and you know all, all these like little things it could not be others oh, it could be something completely different right so it could be the f uh, the the footballers and and their teams it could be um uh, the the homeless person and what they currently have it doesn't need to be a walled simulation it could be a simulation of something more intimate and um you know human uh, but it's still a simulation of of the real world often a very simplified real world um, and you can do anything so so that's satisfying it's it's more fun to me at least than uh, working on apps one thing i should mention is ecs entity component system um, it's just that you should probably just you know if you are let's say you're simulating a pirate ship uh, just work with the the normal objects that you would normally work with, right? If you're uh, if you're using classes in your normal app development, then you probably in your game you'll probably have a class for a cannon and class for a ship and class for a treasure, uh, class for island and so on and so forth, right? And that's completely fine. And these classes can just be mutable, immutable, whatever you want. Uh, it, you can you can do whatever you want, right? Um, uh, but you should know that there is a approach in game development called Entity Component System that is very um, popular. Uh, it is what you would be using if you were using Unity, for example. Um, and it's basically... Uh, I don't think we have time to to really go into it, but it's basically you know we have entities and these entities are just data, and then you have components which are just 
attached to these entities and a component can be this thing has physics and this thing has uh, hit points and this thing ha has the ability to shoot, right? So that's the component and then system is the behavior so it, it will just go through all the entities and their components and be like okay so this this thing is currently shooting so i should create a new entity called a bullet and that bullet is probably going to hit something somewhat at some point right so um just so you know like there are things that are different in game development uh, and and interesting um uh, architectures that you can use uh, but again, don't get too deep into it uh, before you actually uh, do a, 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 at least some kind of game. You know, start building before you start dreaming about architecture. One other thing I want to warn you against is daydreaming too much. If you are new into a new game, uh, uh, you will have the urge to dream about that game and be like, oh, that would be cool if my game could do this and that. And uh, you will do it anyway, but, but try to resist it as much as possible. And instead of, of that daydreaming, build the actual game. Um, you'll, you'll see how it's much easier and it's very tempting to come up with new ideas and new features for the game. And um, then you, your idea goes way beyond where you are currently in reality. And then it almost seems like, why am I even working on this? It's, it's, it's more fun to daydream than to, to, to build the game. So instead of that, do just focus on what you already have and simplify, simplify, simplify. Instead of adding new ideas to the game, remove ideas from the game and make it as, as contained as possible. Um, and uh, you'll see that you're more likely to actually have something for people to play than if you, if you don't do this. Finishing is a skill, um, and this is especially true in game development. Finishing is not something that just happens. You have to learn how to finish stuff, how to drive them to uh, completeness, right? If you're employed, someone else is probably driving you to complete what you're, you're doing, um, and so you don't need to think about it. But if you're a solo game developer, uh, you have to learn how to finish, how to stop improving and how to stop thinking about stuff, but how to actually finish. And finishing is often not fun. Um, I said before, you know, game development is fun, especially at first, but at some point any kind of development comes to a point where things are actually pretty boring and uh, pretty frustrating and you have to go through that phase and you have to actually finish. When I started with game development, I wasn't doing this at all uh, and I would often start a project and then I would play around with it and then I would spend a significant amount of time on doing it and then another project would come by or another idea or I would just get bored with this one and I would just bend on it and then no, I would never come back to it, right? And that's, to me, uh, you could always say like, oh, but I, I, I learned so much, blah, blah, blah. But you still threw away a lot of time, uh, and now you're doing it again and again and again. So before I could launch my game, Knights of San Francisco, uh, I had to learn how to be my own product manager. Uh, I had to actually, like, like it's funny, but, but I actually started uh, not only write Kintin code and, and all that, but also I started creating little spreadsheets for myself and, and being like, hmm, okay, every week I want to go through what I need to do and I would do or want to do and then I will just say no to a bunch of these things and I will try to project when can I, if I go with this route, how soon can I have something that is actually launchable? It's actually something that I can show to people. And uh, that helped a lot and it was very painful. And, but I, I grew as a person as, and as a developer. I became more senior because now I was 
I understood, oh, okay, so uh, it's not just about, um, you know, making the best um, software and code possible, uh, but it's also about de delivering, right? And, and it's uh, so uh, valuable to be able to say no to some ideas and to some refactorings and to, to some, uh, you know, performance optimizations. And instead, instead say, you know what? I'll just, you know, ship it. <laughs> uh, or uh, I'll just remove this cool, cool idea that I think would be amazing but I'm not going to do it because if I did, it would be another five, six months of development. Remember, I was working on my game on in the spare in my spare time. But even without the spare time, some features you can think of could be easily a full-time job for many months, and uh, that's almost never um, uh, worth it. So. Become your own product manager, uh, especially if you're doing this solo, and I kind of assume that you are doing this solo. Um, uh, and don't be afraid to take shortcuts. I uh, remember how I read somewhere that the people who took over the code after uh, Notch, who wrote, uh, the, the creator of Minecraft uh, is called Notch, and, and he uh, wrote that game himself, the, the first version, of course, he wrote himself. And then other people, um, as, uh, as the company grew, there came other people and other developers, and they looked at the code and they were horrified. It was like not cool at all. It was, it was not great code base. And they had to, of course, change everything and, and so on and so forth. And for a lot of people that was, they, they saw this and they, they read these articles and they were like, oh, look at that. That's, you know, Notch was like really stupid and, and bad and that, that's just bad. But to me, especially now after releasing my own game, I'm like, you know what? Uh, Minecraft is a pretty good game. It was made by one developer. Uh, maybe there were reasons why he made shortcuts and, and reasons why they, there was spaghetti code all over the place. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just hard and it's, it's, um, it's better to have something that works and is fun than to, have, to not have something uh, like that but with the best um, code quality available. Unfortunately, I know that like the, our professional pride as software developers is that of like of course we do everything top notch, uh, but if it means that you don't ship your game, then it doesn't really matter. It 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 really doesn't. I, I'd rather play your game um, and know that you cut corners. Um, but it's still a game that can be playable as much as Minecraft was playable. And uh, um, then to, to know that you made the best possible piece of code, but I can't play it because you haven't released anything. So, okay, I'm talking about how you, an app developer or a front-end developer, can um, become a game, indie game developer, basically. Right. So, what are the differences? Obviously, games are not even apply games are not the same as apps. Right. So, what are the differences? The first and most important thing I want to say is that games are cultural artifacts. They, uh, when you compare it with apps, games are there to um, give you some emotions often. They have music in them, they have art, they are more culture than what apps, most apps are, right? Um, and so you have to think about them this, this, this way. You're basically sculpting something. Uh, you're not um, uh, making an order of, uh, of, an, uh, of an app. Uh, it's, there's a form of self-expression in game development and you have to... Uh, I think you have to own this. You, you have to understand that games are not just, you know, made to order 
uh, simulations of real life. No, they are cultural artifacts that you imbue with your personality, with your ideas, uh, with some emotions, and so on and so forth. Yes, games are, even things like Mario, uh, generate emotions, and you have to think about that. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that's the biggest difference, and from that a lot of other things trickle down. One obvious change is that games have more custom design, more interesting design often, right? I d they don't need to be all like all the colors and they don't need to all look like Candy Crush basically. Uh, uh, and on the other hand, they don't all need to look like edgy, uh, you know, 13 uh, year old boy, uh, dark dungeons. <laughs> uh, they can, they, you, you can make games that are very weird and very, the, the design can be very different, but they still often, um, as, like, they, they would be very weird apps, because apps generally try to kind of stay away from having too much of an opinion on design on, and on aesthetics. For example, if you have a game where the player is a spaceship captain and um, she is able to shoot fodder torpedoes on other spaceships, then probably the the icon or the button that lets the player launch a torpedo should not just be a regular regular button that you will find in a normal app. It could be for like a beta version or something like this, uh, or very early alpha, I mean, but at some point you need to make the button cool in some ways, and it needs to be satisfying to be like, pew, you know? So it probably needs sound, um, it probably needs some effect, it probably needs to look uh, differently than a default button or even non-default, but like, uh, you know, app button. Uh, you need to add more art style to it. Similarly, the app itself should be more in motion. It should feel more alive, right? So if you have, a, uh, if you have an app, like a to-do app, um, it could, it's very common and probably desirable that if you're not doing anything to a to-do app, that to-do app will just be static. It would just like look at you the same way you look at it and there would be no no motion there, right? But for games you often want to add a, just a little bit of motion to that and it's with again with modern frameworks um, like Flutter or other um, it's it's pretty easy to be like you know what I want this to be a normal uh, list view or whatever but at the background, I want something to slowly rotate or slowly go out of focus or something like this, right? And, and that alone will make the app or game um, look more like a game and less like an app. Another example is maybe you have a map and instead of just people on the map being just icons, you have the people be like this. There's a reason why this is, I, I know this is a cliche, but like on, in most games, the, the people, instead of just standing like a normal person, uh, people will be like, that's, that's one way to make um, the visuals more interesting and less static. So go for that as well. And lastly, uh, there's a chance that you will have some text in your game. And um, my game definitely has lots of text. Just use the, the usual, I know it's again another cliche, but if you are showing text, show it <clears throat> character by character or, you know, uh, word by word. It really makes a difference. In, on, in an app, you can just show a bunch of text and people will be scrolling up and down to, through it. But in a game, it's... Uh, it's probably a lot better if you let... There are exceptions, okay? But for a lot of text, especially dialogue, it really makes a lot of difference to show the text like... You know? 
instead of <laughs> instead of just boom here's the text now you might be thinking wait a minute that's interesting basically what game development with app like games is like is exercising my ui development muscles a lot and that's also my point that's exactly it if you are even if you there's nothing comes out of of your experience with game development um, you will become a better ui developer because you will be forced to do all these little things like oh a rotating background or oh something that's always animating or really cool button that is really satisfying to click that's something that is a must for games but it is also increasingly important for apps look at current apps they all have these little things i mean the the better apps the the, the apps that we all use and love often have these little things that um, are almost like they come from a game they make the, the the usage of the app more satisfying become a game developer to become a better app developer is what i'm saying another way in which games even app like games are different from apps is how fun is everything games get out of their way to make the experience fun and not frustrating i talked about how games are simulations but i didn't want to say that that simulation the goal of that simulation is to be realistic obviously right i was talking about super mario i think and how that is not <laughs> a realist like it's not real life um uh, so in that sense uh, you should also look at like yes you're simulating something but you're simulating it so that it could be interesting and fun at the same time not that it could be realistic there should be only a hint of realism so that people can be like oh yeah i'm a starship captain or i'm a, a football player uh, but it shouldn't be the same thing as actually being those people okay uh, because being a football player is mostly pain <laughs> and being a ship a spaceship captain we don't know but we're we're pretty sure if it's anything similar to being a captain on a normal ship it's a lot less about interesting things and tactics and a lot more about uh, you know making sure that uh, things don't fall apart <laughs> and uh, just like you know filling in forms and stuff like this so you don't want to be too realistic a classic example from video games but still uh, hopefully you'll get the idea is from platformers like super mario like you know sonic the hedgehog and uh, all the newer platformers in platformers you have a platform and you have your little little guy or girl and then uh, a lot of times what you want to do is you you run this way and then you jump right and uh, you say um, if this was realistic then if I run like this and I go from the platform, I'm already like there's air under me <laughs> and I jump at this point, it should probably not register the jump, right? Because the realistic thing to uh, would be if I, if I just run and then do this, then that ha does nothing to, to actually for me to jump and I just go ah, and die, right? Well... Um, in many in many games since probably the 90s like for decades now if you are running from a platform and you uh, in the game if you are too late and maybe like you're one frame or two frame two frames too late and you uh, push the jump button over here when you have no business jumping because you're already falling, then the game will be like, you know what, I know what you went, you, you were going for, jump. And it will let you jump from air. And this is true. And this is, you, you might be thinking, if you're a gamer, you might be thinking, well, ah, that's terrible. Um, but y y like, y I'm very sure if you're a gamer that you 
um, you uh, uh, this happens to you a lot even if you're not playing platformers every game does these little things that make it less frustrating for you and less realistic but more fun for you to play the game so as a game developer you should know this and you should be able to be like okay you know what this um, sucks it it doesn't it makes the code a lot more spaghetti code it's like uh, we have some kind of physical simulation but now we have an um, exception for this particular thing because the you know the the little the player character if uh, they don't jump they will just they should fall it's not that this uh, there is a little ledge here that is invisible. They will fall, but if they run and jump, they will jump. So, so you can see how that there needs to be some kind of a uh, like a ledge that only uh, um, that's only extended for very, a very specific scenario, and jumps that only that could can work in the air but only for in a specific scenario uh, that makes the simulation a lot more complex and weird and less elegant but it makes the game much better much and the, the player much more happy all right now you know like what the differences between apps and games are you also know that you shouldn't be probably going with um, like you shouldn't spend half a year trying to come up with what technology to use just use what you already know uh, you know that finishing is a skill it's it's something that's pretty hard and especially hard for games i think um, uh, you should you you know that you shouldn't be afraid of spaghetti code because games are inherently a lot more messy than uh, than most apps uh, so now like what do what do you do what's the um what's the schedule or uh you know like like what, what do you do first and, and next and to me it's pretty easy come up with an idea or more ideas pick one start implementing it don't daydream daydream too much and get to a playable thing as soon as possible and before you are happy with it long before you're happy with it give it to other players to try i i can i can guarantee you that uh, by the time you have anything that is even resembling a game you will not have the ability to see if this is fun or not either you will be like oh this is fun but this is w this will be because you you understand what's going underneath the uh, the surface and so it will be interesting for you, but not for the player. Or you will be the opposite, where you're like, this is this sucks because you've been playing this little game for uh, for hours and hours, right? And so you're like, ah, oh, this is terrible. Uh, give it to another person, uh, ideally someone who doesn't like you, <laughs> so some random person. But of course, you'll probably uh, start with a friend or something. And let them play, and they will. And this will. This is very scary, and this is also very painful to watch often, right? Oh, why are you doing this or that? Um, but the, you, you will understand how players will operate in your game, and what needs to be done. And you do this a lot, and. Um, you, sooner or later you'll come to some kind of a game that could be uh, shared more broadly or even uh, be for sale. As always, quality in games uh, comes from iteration. As much as possible, if you can put something out there, try it, change it and do it again, all over again and again, that makes good games. Uh, if you if you don't trust me, I have a favorite book that I have read it now I think two times by Tynan Sylvester, who is the author of RimWorld. Uh, maybe you know that game. Also, in my opinion, an app-like game, by the way. But anyway, uh, Tynan Sylvester uh, made a book called Designing Games, and 
I think his most powerful thesis in that whole book is how it's really important to iterate and how it's really important to not you know write this like design document of like what the game should look like and have something in your mind but instead to have something out there and test it test it with actual people and play test play test play test until you have something that's really cool and he shows that how because time and sylvester before being a solo indie game developer he was in AAA Studios and he shows very good examples from all over the game development um, world where some games, like the, the best games, were just that, iteration and a lot of repetition until you, you get into something that's really, really good. Now, let's say you have a really good core of the gameplay that you that people really enjoy and you think is working, then it's time to start finishing. And finishing a game is, is pretty painful and not very fun, uh, but unless you want this as um, just a hobby, then you, you need to, to learn how to do it. And finishing means, okay, you need to add music, you need to add all the little things, like main menu and stuff like this. You need to figure out what the pricing is going to be, if there's going to be pricing. Uh, you need to add the levels, the content, uh, because it's, uh, unless it's like a little, you know, web game, it needs a lot of content for people to, to be happy with for at least 90 minutes, right? And But often a lot of people and a lot of genres, uh, you have to, keep people happy for tens of hours, uh, which is hard. This is also something I want to touch on that I should probably mention, I should have mentioned in the beginning of the talk is, uh, you have a choice, right? You can build games and you can become a game developer as a hobby, as just something that you do in your spare time and you don't really want to release anything ever or you want to do it as something that you, like still a hobby maybe, but something that where you want to release. Like you, you have a drive to actually become a published game developer. I would argue, argue that you probably want the letter. You want to be able to publish something um, because A, it's, it's more painful. You will learn a lot more from this than from just, you know, playing around with code. Uh, and also it's more satisfying, let's be honest, to be able to say I finished and published a game than to say, yeah, I was, I spent the last, you know, many, many weekends to work on this, uh, but uh, now it's in the face of like, I'm not really sure if I want to work on it anymore, so I'll probably come up with another project. It could work uh, if you really enjoy this kind of stuff. Uh, programming um, but I don't know I, I think it's it's better to, to to drive for actual publishing so assuming that you want to actually publish and maybe even get some money from the game then you should probably think about how to market the game and this is obviously I can't really cover the marketing games here in this video but but like Think about, okay, who might be interested in my little simulation? Uh, who can I reach out to and show them something um, uh, and so, so that they maybe cover it, right? So maybe some uh, local game magazine or something like this would, would be interested in covering your particular weird little game. Hopefully it's weird because why bother if it's not weird, right? Also, be prepared for failure. Even if you have a really good game that doesn't make it like a 100% success chance that it will make money for you or it will get people, so many people excited that uh, you know, millions of people will start to play it. It's a very crowded field. There's a lot of uh, chance and bad luck going around. So, so don't you know, don't, don't have your hopes too up and don't think, don't 
spend for example all your money and all your savings thinking that oh this must definitely um, you know come up uh, well it, it might not it's just the, unfortunately the um, how things go but I think you owe it to yourself to to try it I think it's it's amazing and it can work and it's um, in my opinion there's a bigger chance that you will have a breakthrough and a successful game than there is to th so that you have a successful app these days. Don't forget, like for example, on the App Store, 70% of their revenue comes from games, not apps. And also, let's be honest, if you look at your like the apps that you have on your mobile phone or that you use in your day-to-day -day life, uh, chances are there are not that many that you actually use, right? Like, like I have an email um, thing, an app for email, an app for to-do list, an app for notes, uh, an app for calendar and a few other things. And I almost never change these apps and that's it, right? And by the way, 90% of the creators of these apps are huge corporations, not indie developers. But when it comes to games, once in a while I play a game that is uh, built by an indie developer and I play it for, I buy it, I play it for some time and then I buy another one from another indie developer or the same, right? right? So it's not, um, uh, I think the, the chances of mild or medium success are higher for games than for apps. All right, at the beginning, I said that this talk is for not just for Flutter developers, but for developers of any app framework. Uh, but uh, I'll say that if you are, if you happen to be a Flutter developer, I have a talk, a one hour long talk on the Flutter channel that where I explain exactly like the technical details of how you could build your own game. Uh, there's also this uh, Flutter.dev Flutter .dev slash games where you uh, have other resources that you can use. So so Flutter and I, I'll say that Flutter is especially good for games because it, it, it gives you a lot more um, um, control over each pixel uh, than I think a lot other a lot of other things and also it's cross-platform um, so so I'd say you know if you're completely like oh I don't care which uh, framework I'll use uh, use Flutter but on the other hand if you're currently an expert in Android SDK development uh, use that don't don't try to you know relearn something new just because of uh, of this. All right, I hope I persuaded a few of you to actually try and become a solo indie game developer and that you will have fun and success. Uh, even if not, at least fun and at least you'll learn a few things along the way which you can then use for your normal career. In any case, have fun.